and welcome to Across Africa, our weekly look at stories from across the continent. I'm Haxi Myers-Belkin, it's good to have you with us. Cameroonian doctors furious at what they say are impossibly low wages and appalling working conditions push ahead with strike action. We hear from those doctors. Insecticide-treated mosquito nets have helped save millions of lives across Africa in recent years. But with many communities doubling them up as fishing nets, lakes are becoming polluted and vital fish stocks are dwindling. And we meet rising star of the South African contemporary art scene, Ati Patraruga, whose vibrant tapestries and social observations have won him admirers across the world. But let's begin in Cameroon, where doctors are resorting to strike action to voice their outrage over low and at times non-existent salaries, as well as deteriorating working conditions. It's the first strike of its kind since the country gained independence in 1960. Emmanuel Londis, Zigoto Chaya and Marcel Amoko report from Cameroon. <laughs> One month old Pierre was born at this clinic, 60 kilometres outside Yaoundé. His mother hasn't been allowed to take him home because she doesn't have the money to pay her medical bill. They asked for 120,000 francs. We've already paid for a bit. We have to finish paying, so we've asked them to wait. It's extremely common that families are unable to pay for their hospital treatment, says this doctor. Bonjour. He and his colleagues initiated a historic strike last month in order to bring attention to the poor state of the health sector. The main demand, that doctors be paid. Once out of school, you give the administration your documents and they assign you to a specific area. But this process can take up to two or three years. Many of my colleagues are in this situation right now, and I was too. You can end up not being paid for two or three years. It's hard to live through that. Doctors in the public health sector can go months or years without a salary, like this young 27-year-old general practitioner who wants to remain anonymous for fear of reprisal. Posted in a clinic more than 150 kilometres away from the capital, he still hasn't received his pay two years after graduating. We have to travel long distances to come here, and to survive we have to work for private clinics. Private clinics like this one are booming across the country due to patients turning their backs on public hospitals. Dr Mbarga has invested millions of francs in the latest medical equipment for his own clinic and offers a different kind of welcome on arrival. When you arrive to the emergency room, you are looked after even if we have to do expensive exams and even if we have to do an emergency surgery, we take care of you without asking for payment. Meanwhile, in public hospitals, doctors have planned a further three-day strike starting on May 15th. Hundreds of millions of mosquito nets have been distributed across Africa in recent years. They've undoubtedly saved countless lives in the battle against malaria. But many poor fishing communities have started using the nets to catch fish, with potentially disastrous environmental consequences. Benedict Moran reports from Rakoma, Tanzania. It's a daily challenge, finding enough food for his six children. Like his parents before him, Anzoruni Adam relies on Lake Tanganyika, but with no money to buy a proper fishing net, he uses this, a patchwork of mosquito nets. A real fishing net can cost up to 1.6 million shillings. We can't afford that. Malaria is a disease that kills at least a half a million people in Africa every year. But in Adam's family, no one sleeps under a mosquito net. We need to eat every day. It's better to get bitten by a mosquito than have nothing to eat. Lake Tanganyika provides nearly 60% of protein consumed in this area. But fish stocks are declining. Used to fish, mosquito nets destroy fragile breeding grounds and can release toxic insecticide into the lake. When they are using it for fishing, they destroy the breeding site and they also they catch even small fish from the, from the lake. And they destroy the ecosystem, which in, which in turn can cause the problem and harm to them. A recent study indicates that 87% of households on the lake have used mosquito nets to fish. Tanzanian government officials say cracking down on illegal fishing is a top priority. They vowed a tough on crime approach. The vice president also has announced the, as we fight drugs, uh, that's the same way we're going to fight illegal fishing. Fisheries officials go on stealth patrol at least once a month. On this boat, armed police and local fishermen who provide intelligence. Tonight's sketch, no mosquito nets, but 
other pieces of illegal gear. So this is Irigo. It was arranged in the, in not the proper area. With nearly 500 kilometers of coastline and limited funds for patrols, finding every illegal fisherman is an impossible task and confiscating cheap, widely available mosquito nets might not be the solution. When this net is destroyed, then we'll repair it or make a new one. Anzaruni knows his family can probably survive another bout of malaria, but without food, life will be much harder. Now, cooperative microcredit schemes offer people on low incomes a way to bypass banks and generate useful amounts of cash over time. Cash that often then goes towards funding one-off events like weddings or baptisms. So-called tontine schemes are becoming more and more popular among Senegalese women. They say the weekly pay-ins not only allow them to invest in their futures, but also bring their communities together. Jo Sinclair and Emily Eob take a look. This poultry farmer on the outskirts of the Senegalese capital, Dakar, has revived her struggling venture with the help of a special kind of credit. I bought the chicks for breeding with money from the tontine. At the bank you pay interest, but with the tontine there is no interest at all. Popular in many parts of Africa, women often club together in what's called a tontine to save money. Members of this group pay in the equivalent of around three euros every week. And once every five years, it's your turn to take home the 750 euro jackpot. The bank needs a lot of papers and everything, and guarantees. But we know each other, we live in the same neighbourhood, and we know everyone. In the past, tontines were used to save for special events like weddings or baptisms. But now many women say they're more ambitious. Hairdresser Ndiye, who contributes to four tontines, has used the cash to build a house. I can only count on the tontine. I can't get money from the bank. There is a system of small fines to encourage regular payments into the pot, but sanctions are mostly social. As villagers, we wouldn't dare burn up the money from the tontines without contributing. You'd get an earful. Even your grandkids would hear about it. These women say it's about more than an interest-free lump sum. By giving a sense of community, purpose, control and achievement, the tontine itself hits the jackpot. There are five official languages in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but the country's 77 million inhabitants speak more than 200, among them more widely spoken ones like Lingala and less common ones like Kilege or Nande. With increasing numbers of young people moving to cities in search of jobs, many fear lesser spoken languages and dialects are on the verge of being wiped out. Lohan Bershta reports. Daniel Mukebayi raised his 10 children in Chaluba, a language spoken in the DRC's central Kasai region. But his son Mike has since forgotten how to speak his mother tongue. It surprises me that today Mike doesn't speak Chaluba. We left for Kasai with Mike in the 1970s. At that time he was only four years old, but he spoke Chaluba very well. Mike's wife, Kukut, is fluent in four languages, including Swahili and French, but she never learned Chaluba from her parents. She now says she won't be able to pass down this cultural heritage onto her children. I don't think my mother tongue will exist in 10, 15 years. It's going to disappear. Us parents don't speak Chaluba, so how can we teach it to our children? After gaining independence in 1960, the DRC chose French as its official language. Today, the country also recognizes Swahili, Lingala, Chaluba and Kikongo as national languages, yet hundreds of other local dialects have slowly begun to fade away. There are about 450 languages. We're told they're an obstacle to development. No, they're being pushed out in a conscious way, first by those who colonized us and mostly by ourselves. The disappearance of these mostly oral dialects has also been affected by the DRC's rapid urbanization. Few of the young people who leave their villages for big cities take their mother tongue with them. South Africa has long been at the forefront of the contemporary art scene. Ati Patra Ruga is a rising star making waves at home and abroad, thanks to his colorful tapestries and thought-provoking performance art. 
Franz 24 went to meet the artist at his Cape Town studio and followed him here to Paris, where his latest show is on display at the Louis Vuitton Foundation for Contemporary Art. Olivia salazar Winspear and Caroline Dumais report. Born in 1984 in Mtata, today the artist lives and works between Johannesburg and Cape Town. Adept at various techniques and producing across different media, in Atipatra's studio, attention to detail is paramount. Design blends with photography, knitting with haute couture, and fashion with art. For me, my love for craft comes from basically knowing that there is a tradition of craft. I think that there has been some kind of like ancestral investment in expression. That's how I somehow like to see what I do. A rising star on the South African contemporary art scene, Atipatra's work has been displayed in major international shows, pieces that draw their inspiration from the socio-political context in his country of birth. And the reality of life almost 25 years after the election of Nelson Mandela, marking the end of apartheid. Between 1994 and probably like now, there's been a euphoria in South Africa that came with the elections. And I think that there's something blinding with euphoria. But there is a generation that wakes up with a certain distance and is not touched by the euphoria. And I'm pleased to come from that because we can keep things moving. These are the faces of that generation, woven into the work on the walls of the Louis Vuitton Foundation. Literally sitting and doing a tapestry, sitting and weaving a fate. You cut a thread, you, you, you work with the thread as if it is a storyline or even someone's life. And that exhibition is on at Paris's Louis Vuitton Foundation until the 28th of August. That brings us to the end of this week's show. Thank you very much for watching. Do stay tuned.